how many people in a single day do you share the good news of Jesus Christ? Let's go back to fundamentals. Not how big is your church, not how many pews do you have, not how much carpet you have now, not how many television stations are you on. Let's do the fundamentals. How many people a day do you witness the good news of Jesus Christ to? That measures how impactful you are to. I know if you're impacted by if you're doing anything with it. Because nothing that impacts you do you keep to yourself. So whatever impacts you, you do something with it. I don't care if somebody did your nails good. You would call somebody. I went up to the place up the street. Woo! Have you been there? They tore my nails up. You know, when you're impacted, you didn't need to go tell somebody. You know, I went down, bought this car, man. These people were great. They gave me a deal. You guys, you've been there. You gotta, whenever you're impacted, you share it. And I contend we don't have enough people who are real game changers. Because I'm not satisfied with just being impacted. I'm going to be impactful. That's that person part. Game changer, person and an action. It's not God's objective, and this is huge. Don't miss this. It is not God's objective to affect change. Now, if you've been listening to me, somebody should almost be able to finish that. It is not God's objective to affect change. What is God's objective? Aha. It is not God's objective to affect change. It is the objective of God to affect you. And you will affect change. It is not God's objective to affect change. God's objective is to affect you. And you will affect change. Thank you, my new takers, because I need you to take that home. Don't worry, we, don't, we got to record and everything else for you. I'm trying to tell you, this is where we have to be able to get it. It's not God's objective to affect change. That's the hocus focus God. That's the God of the magic wand. We want God to do the Lord, heal my body. Lord, fix my life. Lord, and God is saying, that's not what I'm here for. More people got confused because they got caught up in the, by, the byproduct ministry of Christ. What is the byproduct ministry of Christ? What's one thing that Christ did with them was a byproduct of his ministry? Anybody tell me? Nisha, tell me. Give me one thing he did that was really a byproduct thing that we got attached to. Miracles. He did miracles. How many of y'all know that was not the ministry of Christ? Miracles were not the ministry of Christ. Christ did not come to do miracles. It's not what Christ came. That was a byproduct of his ministry. And we got addicted to it. He healed the sick. It's not what Christ came. He fed 5,000. He fed 7,000. It was not why Christ came. He raised the dead. Not why Christ came. Why did Christ go? Set the cup, kept the freedom, we might have life, all those good things. Why did he come? How was he going to do that? Y'all are right, but how was he going to do it? How was he going to set the cup free? Through salvation. How was he going to save you? Through love. Through love. How did he show his love? He died. Christ came. To die. He did. He came to die. And they missed his ministry. Did they not? Yes. Of course they did. Can you prove it? Ah. Can you prove it? Y'all know me the next thing is to be proven then. Right. If you're saying to me he came to die, I'm like, y'all are such cowards. Y'all are such cowards. Y'all are such cowards. I ain't moving with him. I know which one. I'm not even here. I just came to get some soda. And I sat down and started teaching. You said Christ came to die. All I'm asking you to do is prove that we missed it. Come on, son. Those who are closest to him didn't even know who he was. Thank you, sir. And they proved it. What did they do? And don't just blame. Who's the guy we always want to blame for missing it? The main guy who really missed it, and we always want to blame him for missing it. Thank you, Judas. Judas is the main character. We want to blame Judas, right? Everybody wants to blame Judas. Why? Because Judas, what? Took the ten pieces of silver, you know, he sold, basically sold them out, right? Yeah. Right. Okay, let me not make Judas the bad guy, right? Because Judas didn't just sell them out. Judas was, Judas was hoping to provoke him. Judas was believing this. Judas believed Christ is powerful. There's no way he's going to let them take him. No way. And 
we've been waiting all this time. Man, when they come get him, he's going to rise up. He's going to, I'm Jesus, and we're going to be in charge. That was Judas' theory. The problem with Judas' theory was, once he activated his part, so I'm going to get them to come get him, right? I know what Jesus says, y'all come get him. Judas thinking it's going to be a celebration, right? Judas is shocked. When? When is Judas shocked? When Jesus said what? I said when he sees them. When what? When he sees the guards with Jesus. Yes. Because he sees Jesus allow them to take, to take him. him. And Jesus is going, I don't know. What's wrong with this man? <laughs> you is a miracle working somebody. I know you can take these brothers out here. I know you ain't going to let them take you like that. Judas is in shock. Apostle, that's a wonderful theory. Prove it to me. I will prove it. Judas is in shock because after he uh, deals with the concept of I am now confused, instead of benefiting from the money, instead of benefiting from the money, Judas now goes and does one. He commits suicide. If it was about the money, wouldn't he have taken the money and just ran? Right. Wasn't about the money. Judas thought he was going to have a sister going to be out going to try him. But he didn't understand the ministry of Christ. Christ came to change the game. He told us that. That's one of the things I preach Sunday. He said, I'm telling you right now, y'all are soft earth, y'all are the world, but y'all don't know me. Because I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill the law. I came to change the game. Everything before me is legislative. I come to bring grace. I come to change the game. You think I came to be king. I'm king of kings, but I didn't come to sit on the throne. I came to die. Because the only way for you to live, the only way for the game to truly change, somebody got to give up their lives. Every time the game changes, somebody gives up their life. Y'all better hear me tonight. Every time the game changes, Come on, name, name a game changer you know that had to forfeit his life in order to get it done. All right, let me say it differently. Come on, African American people, name somebody. Are y'all serious? One person, y'all. Really? I mean, these are game changers. Dr. King, Malcolm X. Let me leave the culture. John F. Kennedy, Abraham Lincoln. Everybody who was game changing had to be in it to the point that they were willing to forfeit their life. Because if you're not willing to die for it, you're not willing to live for it. That's why the Bible says you've not yet resisted under blood. Y'all not going to like me tonight. Because nobody yet has walked up to you and said, are you a Christian? Right. Nobody. We live in a free country. Nobody's challenging you to carry a Bible and take your life. Almost what happens though. Are y'all y'all really believe Christ? Do we really believe it? Has anybody challenged it yet? Do you really know if you really believe it or not? Because paradigm shifters and game changers are in it beyond their personal agenda. Come on, somebody. Some of us can't even tie because our agenda is greater than God's. Hello? You all know you talk about really being a game changer. Giving you hundred dollars church is no big deal. It really is not. Because I'll tell you why, we got more game changers than Walmart every day. Them jokes are come on. Come on, you go to Walmart for $20 and come out $140 in the hole. <laughs> you don't consider yourself a game changer today, you just know what you gotta do. But until what you want is greater, until until what you your, your treasure is, is worth it, you're not gonna release it. Point blank. Game changers, paradigm shifters. They are people who are saying, I get the ministry of Christ. I get it. Peter didn't get it. Judas didn't get it. He didn't get it. Peter said, well, no problem. You ain't gonna stand up. I got you. I'm gonna cut him. I'm gonna cut him, brother. Yeah. Ain't nobody gonna just be in the Somebody gonna do, we gonna do this thing right. Somebody gonna get hurt. They get it. He said, no, I mean, we could, we gonna, we gonna change the game. We're not gonna do it that way. Though. All right? Let's go to the word of God. Let's go to the word of God. Because the Lord said, I'm telling you, I've come and changed the game. Here's how I'm going to do it. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. Jesus came for one thing and one thing only, to die. 
And as Bernard said, to, to uh, reconcile us, right? To bring us back to Christ, to bring us back to God. All right? Jesus came to do what? Reconcile the world. Everybody say that Jesus came, Jesus came to reconcile, to reconcile the, world, the world. Right? But he gave us inside. He died, but the work was left for us. All right? Let's read 2 Corinthians 5, 17. 5, 17. This is what he says. This is what he tells you. I'm going to change your entire life. I'm going to change who you are. I'm going to change the game in you. It's on the screen now. Thank you all. Okay, so let's read. What does it say? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, what? he is a new creature. He's a game changer. Watch that. If any man be in Christ, he is a game changer. If any man be in Christ, he is a game changer. I have not changed his game. I've made him to be a game changer. How to do it? Read. All things are passed away. Uh -huh. Behold, all things are coming. Watch that. Watch that. Right in front of his eyes. Everything that he was, everything that he knew, is all now gone. Everything that he's about to be is brand new. He just changed the game. Because everything you know to hold you back is all predicated upon what's behind you. You have nothing in front of you that keeps you from being great. Everything that can hold you back from being extraordinary is behind you. There's nobody that's going to say, well, my future is really bleak. You don't know your future. What you do is you're basing your opinion of your future upon a series of events in your past. Right? So if I eliminate your past, now what do you think about your future? Think about it. Your opinion of your future is predicated upon what you know about your past. Come on. You think your future is in trouble because your credit score is too low. What about future? You think your future is in trouble because you don't have enough money to buy it. What if I fix that? You think, you think your future's in trouble? Uh, get my daughter seat. Okay. All right. You think your future's in trouble because you've been divorced. What if I say, okay, the pain of that is erased? Well, I got a record. Okay, I expunged your record. Well, I was an alcoholic. Boom, you're no more alcoholic. Now, what do you think of your future? Looking pretty good now, huh? Mm -hmm. Looking, looking a lot better now. And if the only thing holding me up from changing the game is my past, and he's already fixed my past, then now I am a bona fide game changer. Because I no longer have to deal with the hold up of my past. Are y'all following me? Here comes the next point. Read this point out of verse 18 so I can move into my actual lesson tonight. I'm just opening, opening up. I have got some lessons there. Okay? So, verse 18 says what? 2 Corinthians 7, verse 18. 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 18, I'm sorry. Read. And all things are of God. All things are of God, come on. Who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Okay, who introduced us to the first game changer. Come on. And has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. He gave you the work. He gave you the work. Why would I make you a game changer and not give you work? Why would I give you work and not make you a game changer? If he gives me an assignment, He's got to make me a game changer. How do I know you're a game changer? Because you were given the assignment. You were given, I don't care what your ministry calling is, I don't care how long you've been in Christ, you've been given the assignment to reconcile men to God. He's given to you the ministry. Everybody say, I have, I have a, ministry. a ministry. What is your ministry? Reconciliation. I have the ministry of reconciliation. I am a game changer because I have the ministry of reconciliation. I'm a game changer because I can look someone in the face who's had a horrible life and say, your life is going to begin again. Come on, somebody helped you to know that Christ loved you and it changed the game. That's what makes you a game changer. The fact that I understand that Christ is shifting some things in my life. I understand he's giving me this assignment and I cannot be held hostage when I have an assignment. So becoming a game changer is not a real life, not a... Becoming a game changer is like a realignment to your life, not a reassignment. Because you're assigned with reconciliation, but it's a realignment. God wants to realign who you are. 
There are four specific areas in your life that have to be changed in order for you to be a game changer. Four specific areas in your life that have to be adjusted in order for you to be a game changer. Here they are, all right? They are your thinking, your organizing, your building, and your maintenance, or your maintaining. Four specific areas regarding you that must be changed in order for you to be a true game changer. They are your thinking, your organizing, your building, and your maintenance. These four areas have to be affected. These four areas have to be changed. These four areas have to be impacted. And each of these components are operated by a thread called management. That's the thread that connects all of them. All of them have to be managed. Four things that have to happen to you to make you a game changer. Four things. What's the first thing? Thinking. Next thing? Organizing. Next one? Building. Right? Maintaining. There you have it. Maintaining. Thinking, organizing, building, and maintaining. Those are the four areas that have to be affected if you are going to truly be a game changer. Everybody say, I am. I am. A game changer. Okay. So you got to change your thinking. All right? Proverbs 23 and 7 has this. And I'm going to say it's just section A. Proverbs 23 and 7, section A of that. Uh, because this is what the Lord wants you to do. And he keeps talking about this. He says this repeatedly. He says this repeatedly throughout the Bible. Proverbs 23 and 7, verse, uh, 23, verse 7 says what? What's the first few words of that? So is he, right? As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So then your thinking has a lot to do with who you are. How I think, that's who I am. Look at somebody and say, I think I, think. I, am, well. I am well. I think I think. I'm strong. I'm strong. I think I think. I'm clear. I'm clear. I think I'm whole. I'm whole. I think I'm well. I think I'm healthy. I think I'm the bomb. I'm the bomb. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm incredible. I'm a, are you serious? I'm incredible. I'm brilliant. I'm the next great thing. Are you kidding? If you think that, you gotta think optimistic. Why are you doing that, Apostle? You trying to make us feel good about ourselves? Trying to make us arrogant? No, I'm trying to make sure your esteem matches Christ. Yes. Christ is an optimist about you. You are pessimistic in your own battle against Christ. Christ says you're healed. You tell him how you sit. Christ tells you that it says you're well. You tell him how you sit. Christ tells you, you have all power and all access. You tell them how many bills you have and how much debt you have. You keep counter counteracting what Christ is saying about you. He is an optimist on every level. He says, you're beautiful, you're wonderful, you're empowered, you're brilliant, you're intelligent, you're favored, and we keep telling ourselves all the opposite. We have to learn to get on the page with him. That's why he said, will you let this mind being you that was also in Christ Jesus, will you at least let me think what I want to think about you and agree with me? Don't be conformed to everything you see. Everything around you is in trouble. Everything around you is in battle. In the world, you shall have tribulation. In the world, you shall not have peace. But be of good cheer because I have overcome the world, the world right? So don't be conform conformed to what's going on around you. Yes, people around you are in trouble. They're in deficit. That's not you. Don't be conformed, but be ye by the renewing of your mind. By letting me give you a different thought about you. You are a game changer, all right? You're a game changer, so I've got to change your thinking. So let's start with that. Consciously, first part of, uh, there, there are several components in, involved with changing your thinking. Here it is. First thing, consciously decide to dismiss bad situations. This is powerful living. Everybody say powerful living. Powerful living. I gotta give you the tools you need to pull this off. I cannot simply tell you you're a game changer. I gotta give you the tools you need to become a game changer. Everybody know about that? Everybody understand what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. It's important you have these tools. If you have questions, I need you to stop and ask them. I have questions. Yes, ma'am. Hear what you just said. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I said uh, the first thing in dealing with think, changing your thinking is to consciously decide to dismiss past situations. I'm dismissing past situations. 
I'll give you the first example, then y'all gotta rattle off something to me. All right? First example, I dismissed bad decisions I've made in my life. 